From the station working for you, this is WRTV News at 7, streaming now. Protecting vulnerable communities against COVID-19. Tonight, we are taking a closer look at what is being done to make sure there is equal access to the vaccine and why some skepticism about it persists, particularly in black and brown communities. Good evening to you. I'm Mark Mullins. And I'm Amanda Starantino. Experts tell us there are historical issues that have led to mistrust within some minority communities. There's also a socioeconomic aspect that could be preventing some minority communities from getting the vaccine. Some say the root causes of these issues need to be addressed. No matter what are the public health challenge we face, we are still going to come back to the same conversation. The same people are not going to be interested in participating next time. So we still need to go back to those issues of equity. We reached out to state health leaders to see what they're doing to make sure there is equal access for all to the vaccine, but we have not yet heard back. As we track the State Department of Health's latest data, we are seeing lower new coronavirus cases reported today than we have in about a week, but our average is still high. Daily reported deaths also seem to be on the decline, but are again high compared to the summer months. 8,731 people in Indiana have died with COVID-19 so far. And when you divide it by age group, you can see over half of those deaths were Hoosiers, 80 or older. WRTV is also working to put names and faces to all the numbers of deaths and cases because each life is more than just a number. Samuel Gifford grew up in Ohio before moving to Marion, Indiana to be in his wife's hometown. The father of three was a glassmaker who retired young and loved playing guitar and listening to music in his free time, an interest that he passed down to his son. Gifford caught COVID in April of last year while living in a nursing home. After being transferred to a hospital for treatment, Gifford's children were able to see him one last time before he died at 84 years old. His son Gregory says he misses his father every day. Every day we have to cope with this and move on and be stronger. You know, give him the tools of what he taught us and be strong. Gifford says he hopes sharing his father's story helps others who are experiencing loss know that they are not alone. Thousands of Hoosiers have died since the coronavirus pandemic began. WRTV is asking for your help to keep memories alive. If you've lost someone close to you, connect with us. We want to share their story so that those taken from us are never forgotten. You can reach out to facesofcovid at wrtv.com. As Washington gets ready for the possible second impeachment of the president, the FBI is warning the nation's police departments of armed protests. President Trump today stood by his comments to the crowd of pro-Trump rioters who stormed the Capitol last Wednesday. He faces charges of incitement of an insurrection and has been widely criticized for last week's behavior by even members of his own party. Meanwhile, a massive manhunt continues nationwide to track down the insurgents who assaulted the Capitol. And the FBI is raising the alarm about more threats saying armed protests are being planned at all 50 state capitals leading up to Inauguration Day on January 20th. It's being reported nearly 80% of the second round of stimulus checks were sent out to Americans, at least according to one Washington independent public policy organization, but it hasn't been without a hitch. WRTV's Nikki Dementri is working for you tonight and getting you answers on the latest with your check. Don't know which way to go or what to do about it. It's this message on the IRS website that has Christina Flores Morales frustrated and angry. The Indianapolis mother says she's still waiting for her second stimulus check. In the spring, she says she saw the first direct deposit stimulus check fairly quickly in her joint bank account with her husband. It means a lot. I mean, I can pay quite a bit of my bills with this. I mean, I have my house payment to make and car payments. Flores Morales says 2020 was an especially tough year. Aside from the struggles of COVID, she got into a debilitating car accident, lost her job and lost her 29 year old brother. I would just like, you know, to not have to worry about paying the bills. What would your advice be to her? I mean, she can call the IRS. I, their hold times are tremendously long right now. Uh, you know, we could be talking about an hour and a half, two hours. If you have a CPA or, uh, you know, an enrolled agent that you work with to do your income taxes, uh, you, could, you could contact that person. Michael Jamison with On Target Tax says overall, the second rollout of stimulus check has gone, quote, much smoother even despite some issues last week with checks being deposited into phantom accounts. So the IRS said that they are working on getting those uh, payments reversed 
and then get it going to the correct account. The tax expert also notes the second check may not come the same way the first check came. They're trying to make it so they can turn around a lot quicker and not, not make people wait two months. So yeah, they're using both methods. January 15th is the cutoff date for the U.S. Treasury to send out second stimulus checks. Jameson suggests waiting a week or two after this date to see if a paper check or debit card shows up. If you did not receive one or both of those stimulus checks and believe you are eligible, make sure you apply for the recovery rebate credit when filing your taxes. Working for you, Nikki Dementry, WRTV. A bill proposed in the state house could give Hoosiers another way to travel without getting behind the wheel. But there's a long road ahead to get there. WRTV's Cameron Riddle is working for you to learn more about the proposed passenger rail commission. Indiana is already known as the crossroads of America, but a new bill introduced in the state Senate could be the first step to also making the Hoosier state home to the cross rails of America. We think we need to increase uh, rail passenger service in Indiana because it's uh, oftentimes less money than an airplane. Indiana Senate Bill 9, proposed by Republican Senator Dennis Cruz of Fort Wayne, would establish the Indiana Passenger Railroad Commission, an official government entity with legal authority to lay the groundwork for a passenger rail system that would give Hoosiers another option to get around. We'd like to connect the major cities. It'd be ideal to have Fort Wayne, Indianapolis, and Evansville, then Louisville, Indianapolis, and Chicago to connect you know, our major things. We got the South Shore going across the top for a while already. Northwest Indiana's South Shore line could be the blueprint for future rail expansion across the state. The high-speed electric train connects South Bend to downtown Chicago, a transit system that just received federal and state support to expand. Cruz says adding more transit options across the state is key to growth and attracting new jobs. Because yeah, there's a lot of communities that rely on train traffic to get back and forth to work. So if you come to Indiana and we don't have that option as much as they do, then I think that's a detriment for our state in attracting new businesses. A statewide passenger rail system is still several steps away from becoming reality. The bill first has to get a hearing in the state Senate Transportation Committee and much, much further down the line, the support and signature of Indiana Governor Eric Holcomb, who said this when I asked him where he stands on expanding mass transit across Indiana beyond just the roads. I'm all aboard. <laughs> I see it as um, beneficial. Cameron Riddle, WRTV. The Indy Metropolitan Planning Organization says the demand for more mass transit is trending nationally. Getting rail service in Indiana would require cooperation between Indiana counties. The bill is still far from becoming reality, but we did ask Indigo for reaction. In a statement, the agency says, quote, we are excited to work with the state on any potential opportunities to expand public transportation options in the community. Kevin. Temperatures, the big story of the day to go with that sunshine, Amanda. Over the last several days, the range from morning low to afternoon high has only been a half dozen degrees or so. But look at this. We jumped 20 degrees from morning low to afternoon high today, all the way up to 42. First time in eight days, temperatures have reached 40 or above. There are other high temperatures around the region, 43 in Lafayette, also 42s in Terre Haute and Bloomington. Sky was beautiful for sunset this evening. Should have a good-looking sunrise as well. We're down to 34 now in Indianapolis. Columbus at 32. One of the cold spots, Miami County, Peru's at 30. There are your metro area temperatures, all within a few degrees, generally of 35. High pressure ensures we're dry tonight and tomorrow. You wake up the temperatures around 30, 39 by noon. We'll talk about tomorrow afternoon when we'll see some snow showers and have your weekend forecast all coming up. Mark? Coming up here on WRTV, former Indiana Governor Mike Pence was evacuated during the attack on the Capitol. Now we speak with a man who has details from the inside on how Pence is possibly handling the pressure. That's ahead when WRTV News at 7 continues. Palm slash juice kindness. 
This is the news at 7 on WRTV. A federal judge has granted a stay of execution for Lisa Montgomery, the only woman on federal death row. Yeah, she's being held here in Indiana at the federal prison in Terre Haute. She, the stay was granted pending a competency hearing and came just hours before Montgomery was scheduled to die. A date has not yet been set for the competency hearing. Prosecutors have filed a notice to appeal the judge's ruling. 52-year-old Montgomery was scheduled to die by lethal injection today. She was sentenced to death in 2008 by a Missouri jury for the 2004 murder of a pregnant woman. The baby survived. Montgomery's lawyer says that she suffers from brain damage and severe mental illness. Still ahead, we will introduce you to a local performing arts organization that is bringing dance to your living room. Only at Ashley Home Store. Right now on WRTV, after his apparent falling out with the president last week, the nation is waiting to see whether Vice President Mike Pence will follow through with efforts that could remove Trump from office. WRTV spoke with Business Insider reporter Tom Lobianco. He has covered Vice President Pence for years and also wrote a book about the former Indiana governor. We asked him how Pence might be handling this pressure right now. What I'm hearing from uh, his advisors is that he is still opposed to using the 25th Amendment. Um, that, that's what we reported last week, um, shortly after this happened over at Business Insider. And um, uh, I hear that is still the case. Now, um, you know, could they, could somebody in Pence's orbit be floating this as some leverage? The idea of using the 25th Amendment as some leverage and really a defense mechanism for Pence in these final days. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's supremely strange that, uh, frankly, that in, in addition to many other things, that uh, Trump, the president, has not talked to the vice president after the president's supporters apparently tried to murder the vice president. Pence gets angry when people attack his family, when he feels like he is under threat, um, and my understanding of what it looks like is that he's angry now. I mean, look, uh, Jim Inhofe, the uh, Oklahoma senator, uh, longtime Pence friend, um, said that he spoke with Pence during the siege at the Capitol, and that Pence was incredibly upset. You know, hard to tell, really. Um, it's I've seen some preliminary polling that's come out, um, you know, since the attack on, you know, where the Republican base is with regards to Trump. Um, that was the singular question before the attack. You know, how much would Trump control? Um, uh, you know, he clearly controls the RNC now after the, the after the weekend meeting uh, where they reaffirmed his picks to run the party. Um, so, you know, some things seem to be pretty clear, but this is a very fluid situation. I, you know, I'm not even sure that polling will capture this at this moment. We're still learning about the, the rioters that broke in. Um, you know, there's just so much still happening. I don't I don't even know you can gauge politically what's going on just yet. There's just too much in the air right now. The wind kind of offset those temperatures today that made it into the low 40s with sunshine. We had a peak gust just shy of 30 miles per hour in Indianapolis. The wind will stay up a little bit tonight. That'll help keep any fog at bay. Not expecting an issue with that. We may see some mid to high level clouds increase. Temperature range from New Pal at 31 to 36 in Plainfield. Castleton right now, two degrees warmer than that. Statewide temperatures, there you go. From north to south, west to east, no big temperature range. We all enjoyed our first round of sunshine in quite a while. It's 10 day stretch in progress with dry conditions. I think we'll add an 11th and 12th before that streak comes to an end on Friday. There's our view, a beautiful sunset this evening and skies are clear early. As you can see, tomorrow and Thursday, two warmest days as we look ahead through the weekend. Temperatures will fall in the afternoon hours. Friday, another strong cold front will come through, generating snow showers and deliver temperatures back below average for the weekend into the early part of next week. Some specific numbers to go with that bar graph. 45 tomorrow, more clouds on Thursday, temperature about the same. Our chance for snow showers increases as we go through Friday afternoon and evening. 
There's the wind tomorrow. The key to that, the direction, the wind out of the southwest will keep our temperatures about 10 degrees above average. Average high 35. There are temperatures to the north from Logansport and Monticello over toward Marion and Peru. Temperatures in the low to mid 40s. About 45 degrees Rockville, Richmond at 44. Martinsville 46, temperatures to the south, not much different. Again, we'll enjoy about the same amount of sunshine. That's not the case Thursday as the clouds will increase. That'll slow the temperature trend down just a little bit. Friday, low pressure will spin in the Great Lakes. It will develop snow showers and deliver colder temperatures. There's the swirl of the snow showers that will pick up in intensity in the afternoon hours on Friday. Could be some light um, accumulations with that. As we head to Saturday, still some snow showers, 33 degrees. Sunday, 31, that's one of the coldest days as far as our high temperature is concerned. But both uh, Saturday and Sunday mornings, or Sunday and Monday, temperatures in the lower 20s for morning lows. Amanda? Thank you, Kevin. The impact of the pandemic on restaurants, sports venues, and other businesses is well documented. But the devastating effect on the performing arts industry has not gotten as much attention. Tonight, we're putting a longtime dance company in the spotlight and sharing how you can help. Well, I'm originally from Lynchburg, Virginia. I'm from Chicago, so I've lived kind of all over for jobs. I was a dancer in New York for a very long time. I danced with Martha Graham's dance company. You may not think of Central Indiana as a destination for performers. Even though there are so many incredible theater, dance, music, art, like visual art groups in our community. Indianapolis just isn't considered to be one of those communities. But Dance Kaleidoscope, a professional dance company in Indianapolis, is just one group that shows the Circle City has a rich creative arts community. The company started in 1972, originally started as an educational way to teach kids what modern dance was about. And gradually over the years, it became more and more professional. David Hochoy has been Dance Kaleidoscope's artistic director for 30 years. Like many organizations, 2020 was arguably the company's most difficult year in its long history. The pandemic forced rehearsal spaces to close for several months. Dancers returned to the studio in August with some safety changes like wearing masks. It was hard the first week. I'll say it was an adjustment, um, but honestly, like, we'll, we'll do this so that we can dance. Paige Robinson has been with the company for about six years. Despite those adjustments, she feels fortunate. I mean, we're incredibly lucky. A lot of companies right now, I mean, especially in New York, they're not rehearsing, they're not performing, they're completely unemployed. So we're really, really lucky. Robinson is part of Dance Kaleidoscope's first original performance of the pandemic era called A New Dawn. So this will be the first time that I have choreographed such a long piece by myself. Artistic associate Stuart Coleman had the tough task of choreographing the piece while adhering to COVID-related restrictions. When we came back, there were obviously all of these procedures and protocols that were in place, and it just made that piece that I had planned completely impossible. Um, and so I just had to say, okay, back to square one. That means you won't see things like lifts or other partner movements, but Coleman says that won't take away from the creativity and beauty of the show. One of the rules is people can't touch and people have to wear masks. And if you accept that from the very beginning, then it doesn't become something that's inhibiting you. Another big difference, you will not be able to watch the show in person. Like many performance groups, Dance Kaleidoscope is remaining virtual for now. While those with the company are anxious to get back in front of live audiences, they hope you will support the arts in this new normal. What I love to say to the, to the community is, I know that everybody is going through a very hard time right now. If you can, try to help artists as well, because art makes life worth living. A New Dawn is streaming now through January 24th. For more information about the show and everything Dance Kaleidoscope has to offer, you can find this story on the WRTV mobile app. We'll be right back. 877, only ATT. Sunshine makes an appearance again tomorrow, 45 degrees, more clouds Thursday, still in the 40s, and then we've got the snow showers around on Friday. A lot of people waiting for some snow. Maybe we'll see a little accumulation. Amanda? Good to know. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for making WRTV your choice for news. Our next newscast is tonight at 11. We'll see you then.